Hi, and welcome to the Green with Tiffany podcast. I'm your host, Tiffany Page. And in this show, we'll explore topics of sustainable living, all aspects of health and wellness of people and planet, and how we're all interconnected. Join us on this journey to live better and more sustainably by improving our health, our families, and the world with the choices that we make. Hi, welcome Greenwood Tiffany community. I'm so happy that you're here for Pet Wellness Month. So I really wanted to take this month to bring together all the people that I work with directly. I have hands on with them because I bring Lily to these really amazing people and I wanted to share them all with you and share their expertise and their story. So today we're with Dr. Christopher Thomas. Hey, Dr. Thomas. Hey, how are you guys? Hello. Nice to see you today. Thanks. And he is a doctor of veterinary medicine and the founder and owner of Canine Grills, G-R-I-L-L-Z. I love that name. It's really memorable, yeah. which is uh, preventative veterinary dental care. And so it's veterinary supervised non-anesthetic dental, N-A-D. I'm that saying awesome. that slow because I'm not going to say it again. I'm going to just use NAD. And if you need to say it, you can. So sure. for some reason, I was having a hard time saying the word veterinary. So I even pulled it up on Google. So anesthesia-free dental. And so I just wanted to say that here in California, uh, well, all dental procedures, including the prophylactic dental cleaning, is considered the practice of medicine. And it's only performed strictly under the supervision of a licensed veterinarian. So that comes in. You, Dr. Christopher Thomas. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for joining. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This is uh, an honor to be here, and I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, it's very important to spread the word of, you know, alternative uh, modalities for treatment, and this is certainly one that I think is is very important, is attainable. Needs to be standardized, but uh, you know we have a mission on our hands. So, but uh, thank you for sharing our message with you. I'm your so care. happy. That's really great. And I will get in the story how I found you. But you've been practicing veterinary medicine for 15 years. So, what made you move into dental care? Um, so, I started Canine Girls around 2013. A couple of years before that, um, the Veterinary Medical Board deemed non anesthetic dentals uh, a medical procedure. Um, and that I think was primarily in an effort to kind of combat a lot of a lot of laymen who are out there performing these dental procedures with no medical knowledge, no dental knowledge, and were you know harming animals. And anyhow, when they changed those regulations, a friend of mine owned a boarding facility, and he had a non-anesthetic dental service coming in. So uh, they needed a veterinarian to supervise the service, and he invited me, and that was the first time I actually saw a non-anesthetic dental for myself. And I was impressed. I definitely thought there was, you know, I thought some of these guys and gals were doing great jobs with the dental cleaning, but I certainly thought there was some areas um, that needed to be vastly improved, but it was really kind of a light came on. I was like, this is, this is, there's so much potential here. And it's, it's such a potentially important service um, that's historically in veterinary medicine, I believe dentistry is overall neglected. We just don't have the ways and means to get people to get their animals in under anesthesia regularly. And, you know, so we have to find an alternative uh, modality that's effective, but, you know, so that's kind of how I got involved. Okay. And so you, you moved into this full time shortly after, or that was like the light bulb you said that. Yeah. So I just kind of started to, you know, figure out a plan on how to address this hired on a technician. We started the service and we just kind of started slowly building up the service, um, building up the reputation through example, we're very strict on what we will and will not do as far as cleaning teeth. Uh, we send a lot of animals to anesthesia because they have to have anesthesia. Uh, this is not a substitute for anesthetic procedures. The two are meant to work hand in hand, um, but we really need to push prevention first and foremost, um, as opposed to waiting till there's a problem and we have to pull all these teeth, you know, to the point when animals have to lose teeth, that means there's been pretty advanced periodontal disease that has progressed uh, to that point. And so we can prevent that. And that periodontal disease is certainly not comfortable um, in day-to-day -day life. It certainly exposes them to higher risk for, of systemic disease and, and all sorts of other things, shortened lives and all sorts of other things we hopefully, you know, and should be able to prevent through regular care. Definitely. Preventative is always going to be better than treatment. Well, that will take me maybe to my story about Lily quickly. So I took Lily in to get her first dental cleaning under anesthesia. And 
it's so nerve wracking because they, they, they call you if you ask them to, to let them, let you know what it is that they're going to be doing. So she had to have, um, six teeth pulled and they wanted to pull her canines. And I thought that's a really big surgery. Do you, do you need to pull her canines? And they said they did, but I didn't want them to. So they said there were pockets in them and you could get through them. So I said, no, we're going to find something else. And I also know that your teeth are connected to meridians and I didn't want to, I didn't want to pull the canines of a very big surgery. So I did not cut to a year or two later. Um, when I went back, it was the same vet's office, but a different technician. And she said, oh, I never, I never pull the canine teeth if I don't have to. And I thought, well, that's, that's strange. And so when she went in, she said they didn't need to be pulled. She pulled six other teeth, but those, she said the canines were fine. So I'll never know that story, but I was done with that. And I wanted to find something else because I thought it was two different stories. I didn't do anything different. I didn't, we didn't do anything different for her teeth. So how I found Dr. Thomas is I was at healthy spot, uh, which is a, a pet store. That's a, a small chain here in California. Is it in California or is it also in other it's places? Currently in California, it's in San Francisco, uh, like the Bay Area down like to LA and uh, Orange County. Okay. So I went there and they have a great, I just like them, you know, a little bit higher quality products. Not that Lily ever ate dog food, but I went there for something and I saw an advertisement for canine grills with this non-anesthesia cleaning. And I said, that's for me. So that's how I met you. We set up the appointment and, you know, you're just so great the way you run the business, your business and um, the technicians are so nice. They're so kind and gentle and, and they're they love awesome. Lils. <laughs> they're great. They're such animal lovers. We're all such animal lovers, but, you know, it really shows my technicians are very gentle, very loving, but thank you for saying that. Yes. And so I know that you're saying they work together, but I figured if I start doing these preventative cleanings and upkeep and care with canine grill. So I used to go a little bit more regularly, then I wouldn't have to go, um, have any, you know, more teeth pulled. And I didn't, <laughs> yeah, she's I do. been good. Yeah. Yeah. Ideally that's how we want it to work, but you know, sometimes things do arise just like they do in our own mouths, you know, we just can't avoid them, but, um, yeah. So we generally recommend, we want to mimic our pet's dental care to our own dental care um, is how I kind of try to, you know, express the, that need to our clients is, you know, it's all about prevention. Your, their adult teeth come in between the age of six and nine months. And then from that point forward, you should really be brushing their teeth regularly, coming in for regular cleanings every six months with the goal to keep their clean, their teeth as clean and white as your own as your own teeth all the time for all the same reasons. I mean, it's, it's just, we have to kind of start thinking about that. It really kind of makes sense, you know? So um, all that heavy discolored buildup, you know, over time. So, but a lot of clients just don't realize that it's not, it's not, um, you know, really impressed upon us to a lot of clients by their veterinarians. Um, I think kind of because the structure of veterinary dentistry, it's, it's difficult to convince a client that they have to go in and put their animals under anesthesia for X amount of, of dollars once a year, let alone twice a year. So, you know, there's some timidness there, I think, on the on the veterinarian's half. There's definitely pushback on clients' behalf. Um, so it's just kind of the, the system doesn't really work very, very well for, for true, thorough preventative care for our, for our patients. So that's where canine girls kind of came to be when you put all that together. So it's, it's, it's a great, it's great to have. And you, when Lily came in, they, you wrap her like a little burrito and do the cleaning. Take us through what an initial consultation is first it's the consultation. And then what a, what a procedure is like. Sure. So, um, the first thing we do is gain any relevant medical history. See if your dog or cat, um, has any underlying systemic disease, cardiac disease, seizure history, cancer, orthopedic issues that potentially could be exacerbated. Um, during our procedure due to stress, positioning, things like that. Um, we also find out any history on their, on their dental history, if there's been any anesthetic procedures when their last cleaning was, et cetera. That's basic stuff. And then when we bring them into our vehicle, we perform a wellness examination. Again, I do you know, a basic uh, wellness examination from head to toe on the animals. Um, then we do a very thorough oral examination uh, with instruments. And we go around and touch every single tooth. We probe around the, the teeth. Again, we're looking for mobility, significant infection, fractured teeth, you know, all sorts of different things we could find in there. Uh, we do look to identify those issues. And if we do uh, identify anything that must be dealt with under anesthesia, we do not clean around it. We do document it on a dental chart. 
We'd send you with that information. You'd have to get an anesthetic dental this time to get those problems resolved. Then you could come back and see us four to six months later. Then we could start to hopefully maintain them moving forward. But if we don't find anything wrong um, and your dog or cat is comfortable and compliant, depending on their size, you know, kind of depends on how we position them. But someone like a little one like Lily, yes, we wrap her and we swaddle her like a baby in a towel, you know, being very conscious of her anatomical positioning. Um, and then, uh, you know, that's kind of how we, that's kind of how we get them positioned. But technicians use one hand to kind of control and open the mouth and the other hand for the instruments. But as long as the animals are comfortable and compliant, um, we actually get in, we can actually get in there. I don't know if you can see this. this little oh, wow, look at that. He, yeah. he has a little uh, sample of a a dog's mouth there. That's wild. So if an animal was under anesthesia, um, we'd use a, a metal uh, mouth gag to kind of keep their mouth open and be about open that wide. Um, and what we do is we just mimic that with our hands and we use one hand to kind of control and open the mouth and then the other hand for the instrument. And as long again, again, as long as they're comfortable and compliant, we have the exact same access. We use all the same dental instrumentation, scalers, curettes, ultrasonic scalers, mechanical polishers, clean the teeth the exact same way. Yes, we clean above and below the gum line. We, there's literally no difference between our anesthetic, our non-anesthetic dental and an anesthetic dental, um, as long as the animals are, you know, pass our, our uh, oral examination and our behavioral assessment. Okay, so and large dogs, real quick on large dogs, they're kind of late at what we call lateral recumbency. Uh, again, between the technician's legs, the neck kind of rests on one of the technician's legs. And again, we use the same hand uh, positioning to open and kind of control the mouth. Yeah, I would imagine the larger dogs would be a little bit harder. But do you recommend, like, I know, I think Lily gotten later as she got a little older, a little spicy, you know, any CBD or any kind of sedative? Is that something that um, sometimes sometimes there's animals that are behaviorally non-compliant and we have to turn away because it's just not safe for them or us to mm -hmm. you know get in their mouth we don't want to you know we certainly don't want to obviously physically harm them we also don't want to psychologically traumatize them we never force an animal through it so if we are able to get through the examination and determine that there's nothing that needs to be dealt with under anesthesia it's just a behavioral thing then what we generally recommend is to obtain an oral sedative come back in another day and we can try again. I'm going to tell you, CBD is not very effective for this, for us. Um, there are some dogs that are quite responsive from a, sed from a sedation uh, standpoint with CBD, but the great majority of them, unfortunately, don't respond well enough for us to, to be effective with CBD. But so we generally have to go the pharmacological route and, you know, go the chemical route. But that is still, you know, it, the same kind of medications that work well for animals that have a hard time flying on a plane or, you know, are scared of fireworks or thunderstorms. Those medications usually take the edge off enough. You know, they're wide awake during the procedure. They go home and maybe take a long nap. But, uh, so, you know, sometimes we're effective that way. It's not a guarantee. This procedure is not, not for every animal. They do, you know, they do have to be able to tolerate it uh, behaviorally for it, to, for it to really be effective. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, yeah, Lily was great with it most of the time, except towards the end. She wasn't, she wasn't too tolerant anymore. So, do you recommend certain breeds have more upkeep like a Chihuahua? I mean, do you find that certain breeds have just genetically have bad teeth and really should be seeing you more often? Yeah, I think the smaller breeds, you know, it's kind of known that the smaller breeds, they have smaller teeth. Those teeth have smaller roots and they sit in smaller jawbones. So they're just not deeply, uh, strongly rooted teeth. So we really need to keep those teeth as clean as possible. Certainly, um, there's a potentially a genetic predisposition with breeding and, and things like that. But again, if we can kind of think to focus on keeping their teeth as clean and white as our own teeth, that is what we really need to do now. Um, the smaller ones, brushing is is even more important than the big dogs. They're not avid chewers. Um, so uh, definitely the smaller breeds stay up on it. I mean, all of them really, there's no, there's no, there's no real exception to that, but definitely the smaller breeds probably need more attention. It was so hard. I tried, I tried to brush her teeth. I should, you know, if I'd started it when she was a baby, maybe it would have been better, exactly. but starting it when I did, which is when I met you, which was much later, I, I mean, she, you know, and she's only six and a half pounds and you think, okay, I can get this toothbrush in your mouth, but she would have, she was having none of it, none yeah. of it. So I saw you more often, which the coincidence is I actually go to my own hygienist more often too, yeah. <laughs> because I hate to floss. I know that's terrible. I shouldn't say that out loud, but, um, so I go more often for cleaning. <laughs> In fact, I actually brought Lily to my hygienist, if you can imagine that. I know that's probably not very, I don't know, clean, the cleanliness of having a dog, but she would lay in my lap while I had my teeth clean and my hygienist loved her and would always just want her to come and like, you know, 
brush your teeth. Tried yeah. to, that didn't work either. <laughs> <laughs> Only you guys were able to do it. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of what we face. Some of those little ones are very, very tough, you know, and very, very you know, strong willed. So they are one of, one of the veterinarians I took her to said that she was spicy. So you do cats as well. Did I see that you have cats? I don't yeah. think I've ever seen a cat go in for an appointment. Is that common? Uh, yeah, we probably do a, a couple cats a day on average, I'd say. Um, they are actually excellent patients. Are but, they? That's actually, so funny. I would never think that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're able, we're, our success rate on dogs is probably from behavioral standpoint, it's probably about 93 to 94%. And um, on cats, it's probably 95 to 96, a little bit better. They're very, very tolerant. They have smaller teeth, fewer teeth. Um, they're generally pretty well behaved. That being said, in regular medicine, if, you know, in a veterinary hospital, I'd be much more fearful of working with a cat than I would with a, an aggressive dog, an aggressive cat than an aggressive dog. They are fully armed fast and, and you know, they, they don't mess around, but for whatever reason in our procedure, they tend to do very, very well. So that's funny. They like their teeth. Clean. I feel like some of these animals might, you know, they, uh, animals are very smart and very intuitive. And you know, I think some of the animals that even start out kind of nervous and scared at, at the start, after we kind of get into it, they realize they're not being really harmed. They settle down to it and really relax. You know, I think that, you know, a lot of them really realize that we're there to help them and they just relax. So well, that's good. That's good to know that you can take your cat too. Um, where did um, the collaboration come with, with Healthy Spot? And do you do, do you have others or is that the main one that just keeps you busy since they have so many locations? Uh, right now, it's the main one that keeps us busy. Um, we've been with them since 2014. So about a year after we started, that is kind of an interesting story. I, a friend of mine was friends with one of the owners, Andrew, um, and her and I were doing some uh, charity work someplace. And she's like, you should meet my friend, Andrew. He uh, owns this company called Healthy Spot. And she knew that I was a veterinarian, of course. And she thought that we both would kind of, we both kind of aligned on our philosophies about things. And so um, that's more or less how I got the, in, the uh, introduction to Andrew. And uh, he had through again, kind of how things were going with regulations in, in non-anesthetic dentals, they had had a previous service that was not that was subpar, um, and they were looking for a change. And we just kind of happened to meet at the right time, the right place. And when I started working with Healthy Spot, they had three locations. Now they're up to about twenty or twenty, I think about twenty-one or twenty-two. Oh wow! Are you in we're, all of them? Uh, we're except we're in all of them except for um, Century City and Playa Vista, and that's basically just due to. Um, parking restrictions because we work out of our vehicle. There's no room for us there. You know, it's really allowed us to have a great uh, span uh, of reach and kind of get our, our our service out there and seen. You know, what I really want is for other veterinarians to see our work. And and the way that I do that is by turning these animals down and sending them to anesthesia with our information. So veterinarians who at, at first were a little bit reluctant or had, you know, negative philosophy, negative opinions about non-anesthetic dentals have a lot of them have not come around to realize you know just how important our our particular service is and how we function and how again how integral the two services anesthetic and non-anesthetic you know must really be so um, but again that all basically comes from our my relationship with healthy spot and our ability to get into different neighborhoods and uh, you know, meet their clientele, and it's been very beneficial for both of us. So I'm very, very thankful for that relationship. Yeah, it was great. It's how I found you. Yeah. Um, and then, do you always know you were going to be mobile? Of, of how you did it? Um, well, we didn't actually get in the vehicles until I think 2017. So we were working in store for a while, and that was just not. It was not very smooth, and so the vehicles really just kind of changed our game. And again helped with all sorts of different things, just brand recognition and our mobility. The, the, the model that we have now, the mobile model is great. Again, we can kind of set up shop wherever we need to. And, you know, there's no significant overhead, which is good for us from a business standpoint, but we do have, we do intend to, you know, kind of move into brick and mortar and do some, you know, anesthetic dentals as well and uh, start some training courses for technicians. Cause again, we want this to be, I want this to be the primary modality of dental care as opposed to going to anesthesia first. So, Well, that would be great. So that's the future of canine girls, huh? When you went to veterinary school, how was the training for dental care? To me, it was inadequate. We had, so the mouth is obviously the beginning of the GI system. So we really, most people, most veterinary students learn about dentistry as a couple lectures in internal medicine. I happened to take a, an elective in my clinical rotations on dentistry. So 
I had clinical experience that way, but for the most part, unfortunately, it's not very extensive. And most of it is, is, you know, what, what veterinarians, you know, choose to choose to pursue following school as independent study. So it's, it's a mixed bag, what you'll get out there uh, as far as coming out of school. Um, but again, it, it's overall, I would say, I don't know if this is a bad thing for me to say, but the truth is it's, it's kind of woefully inadequate, you know? Um, so, well, maybe you're here I'll, to do a new curriculum with it. So there's, that's, uh, I mean, meant I, to I, be. again, that's, yeah, that's what I'd kind of like to do. Again, I'm, I'm preparing to get to the point where I, you know, I want to start to talk to conferences and, you know, go to vet schools and, you know, really kind of just be able to thoroughly express or explain our, our example and, and see how, how well it works with our veterinary colleagues in our community. So it's, it's been, yeah. Yeah. That's a big game changer. You know, I really love when you take a video of of the dog's teeth and then you have this video so you can actually see yourself what exactly is going on, what's moving, you know, and point that out. I think and that's helpful to take also to your main vet as well. Yeah, that's been a, that's a game changer for us. Um, it's I think, you know, animals can't talk. And a lot of these animals who have this advanced periodontal disease have been living with it. And, you know, sometimes they'll even go to their veterinarian, the veterinarian will lift the lip and not see these things. You actually have to touch these things. So the video, and, and, and that can go on for years, unfortunately, like that. So but clients sometimes have a hard time believing that there are significant loose teeth that need to be pulled. And so when you actually graphically see that in a video, it, you know, it, it kind of really drives clients you know, to get that thing done. So, and then, like you said, it's very helpful for the veterinarians as well to see what we are looking at. So yeah, it's yeah. been a great tool for us. So you're here in California, uh, the greater Los Angeles area, you mentioned San Francisco. What do people do? I mean, I know you probably don't know the laws of all different States, but you know, there's some that it, do they have to have a veterinarian on? So on the, it's, again, that's, that's another mixed bag. It depends on the state. Some states uh, you are, are like, are like California where they have to have a veterinarian present. Some states there doesn't have to be a veterinarian present. It's kind of the archaic, what is illegal in California way. Um, so, you know, and then there's some states where it's just outlawed in general, not or not on a down. So um, that's too bad. Unfortunate. Yeah. Nevada is a state that, used to ban non-anesthetic dentals. And now I think they have come around to adopt. I'm not hundred percent. I didn't have a chance to look this up, but I think that they have uh, adopted the model of California where it has to be veterinary supervised, which is great. But that being said, you know, again, even between veterinarians, if there's, you know, other veterinarians out there who may be doing this, we need to collectively come together and really standardize this so that we're all doing this the exact same way. And we are, you know, processing the animals and assessing the animals the exact same way and utilizing anesthesia absolutely when it's necessary. No ifs, ands, or buts, you know, not, not, uh, you know, not cutting any corners, getting the animals the proper care that they need, and then getting them into the preventative non-anesthetic service. So... What do you say to people who have an older dog and, and having anesthesia or, you know, who, for, for the pet parents who are a little bit nervous about that? So I'm, I'm a huge proponent of anesthesia. I'm not scared of anesthesia. I always tell clients with older animals, age is not disease, disease is disease. Cause that's just the fact. So um, the systems that process and metabolize anesthesia, the kidneys, the liver, the cardiovascular system, um, those are the systems that are, are, you know, in charge of maintaining life and again, metabolizing and get rid of and processing and getting rid of those anesthetic medications. So if those systems are functioning properly in the body and the animals are in, in, in good body condition, in my opinion, there's not a substantial uh, increase in risk of anesthesia, but we want to limit exposure to anesthesia in any animal. You know, unfortunately in veterinary medicine, we don't generally benefit from having board certified anesthesiologists running all of our everyday um, anesthetic procedures. Um, so things can happen, but they can happen in, 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 in humans as well, as well. But overall, anesthesia is pretty safe. Older animals that are, in, again, good body condition, systemically healthy, I'm not opposed to putting them under anesthesia. We've had, we've sent 16, 17, 18, 19 year old animals to anesthesia. And, you know, with advanced periodontal disease who 
to a, a part of me is kind of amazed that they lived to that length, that age, having advanced periodontal disease. But uh, long story short, they'd have these anesthetic procedures, they'd get through them, and then the the owners would always, you know, tell tell us that the animals seemed like they, you know, a little bit of their puppyhood came back to them, so they felt a lot better. Oh, so that's so great. That's great to hear. Yeah. So if people you know, not everybody here listening is in California. What, what are some of the questions that they should be asking when they find a place or how can they, you know, what, what, what are, what should they be looking for and should they ask about? Sure. Well, I think again, I don't, I don't think this procedure should be done anywhere without veterinarian supervision. So that's my number one requirement. If they just don't have that as an option, um, you need to find out what their knowledge base is, basically, what, what they're basing their decisions on. Are they cleaning around loose teeth? Are loose teeth a problem to them? If there's not a veterinarian there, I basically don't, I do not advocate for that. Let's just put it that way. But um, if there's a veterinarian there, you know, the veterinarian is responsible for that animal's care. And again, I hope that they're, you know, making the right decisions, but we should not be cleaning around loose teeth. We should not be cleaning around significant gingivitis, obviously bad fractures, things that have to be dealt with under anesthesia. You basically want to know if that veterinarian is going to, you know, send you away. And we, a lot of, unfortunately, I think a lot of clients look to non-anesthetic dentals as the only option for dental care. And we, that's not how I look at it. Mm -hmm. And the two systems have to work together, but if we have a, if we can maintain a healthy mouth then anesthesia is, is generally not required often. So. Well, that's good to know. I think people are maybe thinking that this is they want to do this and only this. And that's the hope if they keep up with it and take care of their dog's teeth, but not necessarily. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So I wanted to know what got you into veterinary care in the first place. What made you have a love of animals? We asked that question a lot. I remember my very first memory of wanting to be a veterinarian was when I was, I think, five or six years old. My very first dog, Angel, was a Weimaraner. And I remember going to our veterinary hospital with her. I think she, you know, she must have been my best friend. And Aww, so cute. I remember going in there and the doctor, I can't remember her name, but I remember watching her interact with my dog. And I was like, wow, I just was mesmerized. And I think my parents tell me from that day forward every day, or anytime anybody asked me what I want to be, I want to be a veterinarian. I've had dogs my entire life. And I just remember my entire life saying, I want to be a veterinarian and eventually made it happen. So that's pretty impressive. Not everybody always knows. I mean, there are a lot, but not many, you know, always knows what they want to do so young and that's it and, and then make it happen. Yeah. That's impressive. Love it. Love it. Yeah, thanks. So canine grills, you can find them at canine G R I L L Z.com. So you go to different branches of healthy spot each day or every day of the week is a different place or how does that work? Yeah. Every day of the week is generally a different uh, location. Um, our schedule's on our website. Um, but yeah, so we're up in the Bay area every other month, currently trying to get a little bit more established up there. You know, we could be, so you go up there. Yep. We fly up there. Oh, wow. That's yeah. Funny. We have another, we have a van staged up there. So we leave it up there and fly up there every other month for four or five days. Um, knock out as many as we can. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the goal is to obviously, you know, get full-time service up there as well. But, uh, yeah, so currently we're at healthy spot. Stay tuned because we will hopefully be opening up an anesthetic office here soon. Um, and then as we can get more technicians trained, we'll hopefully be able to branch out elsewhere as well beyond the healthy spot, but, uh, yeah, Very and exciting. It's online via the website. So, so I love the fact that your love of animals brought you to be a veterinarian. And then through that, now you found this whole other niche that's so important. And, you know, I, I actually don't even know another place that does it. I mean, I haven't looked, but I don't find it to be as I've never seen another advertisement for it is what I'm saying. It's not a standardized service yet. And that's my, that's my, that's my number one goal. There's not really any places I can really, unfortunately, I know of that work at the standard that I, that I think is acceptable. Um, but that's what we have to strive for. I developed a tier system on kind of rating services because there are services out there. Tier three are legal operators. People who are working without veterinarian supervision. Tier two providers are people, are staffing companies or groups of non-anesthetic technicians. I don't know their training background. They don't work under one specific medical director, but they go and they subcontract veterinarians and they work with different veterinarians at every different location they work at. Um, that's very inconsistent care. Those are what I call tier two. And then tier one would be a, a veterinary a service like canine grills. It's owned by a veterinarian 
has one specific medical director. Every procedure is performed the exact same way. Um, so that's what we, that's that's my that's what I intend to shortly uh, introduce to the vet medical board, so we can hopefully adopt that kind of uh, verbiage and amongst veterinarians, so that we can help to classify and inform the, cl- uh, the the public and be more informed as to who they're dealing with when they do go to approach these services because. It, it, the, the service has so much potential, but we're really just hindered by these um, illegal operators who are continuing to do terrible work, harming animals, and continuing to perpetuate the stigma that unfortunately has been around um, based off of their poor work. So it can be done so well. It just needs to be adopted by other veterinarians. And, and you know, collectively, we need to address, address things the exact same way and, and standardize things. So that's really exciting. So if you're out there and you're taking your dog to a non anest an NAD, you know, no, ask if it's the same veterinarian that's on staff there that's going to be overseeing things so that they know your dog, that they know what's been happening and what's the changes might have been in the next, you know, handful of months that they come. So typically you ask the dog dogs to come every six months. Yep. Four to six months. Yep. Um, it's kind of depends on, you know, every individual dog is different. Um, how, how quickly they build up if the clients are brushing, but a general rule of thumb is every six months. Um, you know, we don't, we, the, the old approach to this and still is the common approach in many veterinary hospitals is they just lift the lip and see if they see really heavy discolored buildup. Just again, think of the, they think of their teeth as your own teeth. Imagine what that would feel like having a millimeter of t- brown discolored tartar on your teeth every day all day long you would never tolerate it i hope but the goal is just mimic your own dental care with to your dog mimic your dog's dental care to your own dental care but uh, yeah so every four to six months brushing regularly ideally every day it's hard to do i'm laughing at that because it just never happened (laughs) and it i'd say maybe Unfortunately, only about 15, 20%, because I, I get it. It's tough and not every animal is going to tolerate it, but it's, you know, brushing is definitely, you can accomplish it. It's like training them to do anything else. You just have to be, you know, patient, consistent, and thorough, but in, and like you said earlier, start at a young age. So yeah, I think that would be good. Well, with that, we could get into some tips you might be able to give the listeners for their fur babies. What do you think? <laughs> What you got? Well, we kind of covered them all. Number one is brushing, of course, regular, consistent, um, preventative dental care starting at a young age. Um, you should start brushing between, like I said earlier, the, the adult teeth should come in by about nine months of age. You should probably start brushing their teeth around them around that point. Just like when they're a puppy, you want to start to play with their, you know, their paws. They get used to, you know, the paws being handled for nail trimming and things like that. You should be trying to introduce a soft bristle toothbrush and brush their teeth regularly come in for their first cleaning between a year to a year and a half of age and try to come in every six months uh, thereafter uh, definitely stay away from any rock hard shoes like like actual marrow bones uh, yak bones nyla bones antlers those are all rock hard and we see those those items cause catastrophic fractures almost on the daily uh, at work so really yeah. oh no I've given antlers to friends dogs. That's a no. Yeah, those are definitely a no, no, hundred percent. No antler, you know, you're, you're talking about you're, those are usually elk antlers or, or deer antlers even, but those are several hundred pound animals that use those, those, those antlers to clash in each other um, or to do whatever they're doing um, or a, a cow's femur. Those are the, usually the bones that you get in the pet store. Those are, those are in charge of maintaining the weight of a 1000 pound uh, cow or bull. Um, and those are just not meant for 10 pound, uh, little dogs teeth to tolerate. So unfortunately they do fracture their teeth on those all the time. And when those fractures are what we call complicated involve the interior compartment, which is the pulp cavity, those teeth are basically lost and they have to be pulled under anesthesia and that's completely preventable. So anything that you wouldn't want to chew on your dog probably shouldn't chew on. Well, she liked what are the what are those other little sticks, like little bully sticks. I definitely don't want to chew on a bully stick, but she likes to. <laughs> uh, I mean, again, anything. What I mean by that is anything that you would never dare chew on from a from a, a hardness standpoint. A hardness standpoint. Okay. All right. And uh, those are really good ones, actually. And I, yeah, brushing the teeth starting early is good. And actually, when you said about you know with the paws, because some dogs don't like you to touch their paws, and that's a great one. That one I was good with. She didn't mind her paws because I love them and I always play with them. Um, so great. Well, thank you so much for your time and your love of animals and your care that you've given Lily. And um, 
much success to the expansion of canine grills and where it could go. I think it's really important for people to take care, uh, pet parents take care of your little fur babies, and this is a great way to do it. So it's canine grills and they're offering things, Dr. Thomas. So for the month that this um, gets aired, um, so depending on when you're listening to it, if you want to go back and look to see at the date that it was released. So for the month, um, you can get $20 off for your first procedure. And when you go into healthy spot, you can make your appointment, let them know it's green with Tiffany, and then you'll get the $20 off. So thank you yeah. for that. So sure. for those of you out there who want to give it a try, I highly recommend it. If you are looking to find somebody and have some, some NAD preventative care for your, for your dog's teeth with the non-anesthesia. Thank you so much for having me um, and sharing the message. And yeah, if anybody out there has any questions, please visit the website, feel free to email us, reach out, check us out on Instagram. You can kind of see what we do on our story highlights. We have a lot of misconceptions uh, kind of addressed there. Um, so, but yeah, thank you so much, Tiffany. I uh, really appreciate what you're doing for animals. And uh, it's been a pleasure having you as a client. And I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. All right. And you can follow me on Instagram and hopefully one day I can come in. Actually, I've actually never been in the truck. I've never been in it. So maybe I'll come by sometime and do a little video that way. Absolutely. That's a great idea. I'd love to have you. Wonderful. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. It's Pet Wellness Month. More to come. And feel free to like, subscribe and share. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please rate, review, subscribe, and share on Apple Podcasts. It would mean the world to me. You can find me at greenwithtiffany.com and on Instagram. Till next time, choose to care.